Hey guys, welcome to Eat, Play, Poo, episode three. I'm Brad Hull. I'm your co-host with host Jeannie McClymont, who's going to join us very shortly on pre-recording um, this intro because we didn't hit record when we first did it, but uh, we did get all of the interview, interview um, which uh, our very special guest, Marina Yakabu, is joining us, an accredited accredited practicing, practicing dietitian, a research dietitian, and the senior project manager at the Department of Gastroenterology at Monash University. So really, really excited to have her on and uh, bring her to you. We're going to talk about the low FODMAP diet, um, break it down, what it, what it is exactly, exactly uh, where you can find more information about the diet and how you, I guess, go through the process of getting a diagnosis of IBS to see if this works. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about the training program offered to all dietitians, health practitioners, um, to s give them the skill sets to properly implement a low fobat diet. Um, so yeah, it's an exciting interview. It does go for about an hour. Uh, so sit back, relax. I start by asking Jeannie, um, you know, we were talking about the IBS epidemic and what exactly is IBS. So sit back and enjoy. Badly behaved bowels is is huge, and yeah, I think IBS. You may not have an IBS diagnosis, but I think there's a lot of people out there who do have symptoms of IBS if they actually did get sort of diagnosed. Um, and if, if you look at the amount of cases that are actually recorded, the statistics are massive. Yeah, it's it's a, sort of like um, I understand the meaning. Uh, but a lot of people don't really understand the meaning of IBS. What is, does IBS mean in your... It's Well, it stands for irritable bowel syndrome. So if you have to go to the doctor and they can tell you, hmm, yes, your bowel is irritable, you're like, I knew that. I knew my bowel, there was something wrong with my bowel, confused, irritable, you know, badly behaved, whatever. Um, but I think the diagnosis is... It's a really different diagnosis. It's basically they're going to test you for all of these other things that it could possibly be. And if it's not showing up as it's none of those things, then oh, too hard basket, IBS. You know, yeah, you've wow. got IBS. For me, that's the understanding of how it's currently working. There is a criteria that, you know, they generally will have, have to tick all these boxes. But yeah, I think there's a lot of different IBSs out there. Well, for those of you who just joined us, both in the webinar and on the Facebook Live group, I'm sure there's some of you guys that have that diagnosis of IBS, and I'm sure there's some, um, you know, practitioners that may watch this episode later on, and hopefully we can offer some really good insights in helping those patients, um, you know, particularly with a with a low FODMAP diet. It's yeah, it's one of the um, the standout tools for managing a previously really unmanageable condition. So. So because this is a live webinar, um, those are in the webinar, you can ask questions. We'll look at answering some of those at the end, but we won't answer any questions through. And for those of you on Facebook, um, you know, give us a thumbs up. Make sure you can let us know that we can hear you. Or if you're on the webinar, put a hand up. So we're up. not talking to ourselves. Yeah. So it's all working. <laughs> Which Brad loves to do anyway. Well, we've actually done a meeting as you, well, we did a, uh, a show and we did the complete show and it didn't record on live. So, um, yeah. yeah, it's... Uh, Hopefully, uh, we're not making that same mistake. So without a further ado, I'd like to welcome Marina. And um, let's uh, say hello. Hello. Are you there? Yes, I am. Hi. Hi, Brad. Hi, Jeannie. Thank you for having me along. No Thanks. worries. Thank Thank you. You. Yeah. Hi to the many followers that um, may be listening in. Yeah, well, it's, uh, we really appreciate your time. I know you're extremely busy. I think we've been trying to track you down all over the globe and you're in one country, then somewhere else. And um, yeah, things are, uh, uh, you've got a busy, hectic schedule, yeah? Yes. Um, yeah, absolutely. We are <laughs> traveling around a lot. We have a lot of interest from in, um, internationally as well as nationally um about what the low map diet is and 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 why it's so effective for people that do have irritable bowel syndrome as you mentioned um ibs so um we you know we're attending conferences all the time presenting not only our research but the story around the low map diet and a lot of the programs that we run out of our group as a result of the the research so um, we've been very fortunate um, that we've been, I, I guess, a group of clinicians and scientists and researchers that have been able to translate our research into practice and you translate it into a lot of different tools that people can use to, to help them. 
Yeah, great. Look, before we go into the topic, which is, you know, what does the future hold for people with IBS? Tell everyone who doesn't know you. So uh, a little bit of your backstory, I guess, where you started from in university, how you got down this path of the low format and, and um, working with the Monash University and your own clinic too, I think. Yes. Um, okay. So uh, how long do we have? just just Um, abbreviate into an acronym (laughs) yeah okay um I did have a previous life so I don't know if we should go down that life but I think um it's probably what has actually led me to today so just briefly to um a long story short on that I actually was a project manager in a big corporate world um looking after many contracts around the country in the communications industry so I then I'm a lover for sport and I um, found that nutrition was key for sport and that eventually evolved into nutrition was where it's at so I then did um, my I guess some couple of science degrees and found that I needed to marry up my interest of sport and dietetics and um, that's the path I went down through university and um, did a lot of, I've been doing private practice now for 13 years, but um, my major focus in private practice as a result of my research um, is paediatrics. So I practice a lot in the world of paediatrics as a dietitian, um, the GI space, so gastrointestinal space, so gastroenterology. And I still dabble a little bit in sport, but um, that has actually helped me, my corporate world in the business Um, I guess framework has helped me manage not only a PhD um, but also bring together the research and a lot of the projects that we're bringing to you know our patients our consumers of food the health professionals and putting together some you know big projects to um, you know give um, I guess something to the people that need to use this yeah yeah great so can you share your sport um yes well hang on now that's another story but uh, I love volleyball believe it or not point guard basketball but um um mainly a runner now now we've met I don't think you can slam dunk can you (laughs) no unless you picked me up (laughs) Uh, that's okay (laughs) all right um, I'm interested to know the the here and now today as you sort of mentioned um you know towards the end Give us a bit of an idea of the size of the low FODMAP team, um, you know, who you're working with and, you know, I guess how long it's been developed and, you know, I guess to give an idea of the size of, of what's actually going into this. How many people are researching yeah. and discovering and, yeah, what's... Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess how the team started um, really as a group of researchers and clinicians investigating um, dietary therapies for, you know, its, its effectiveness in treating bowel conditions, particularly for people with irritable bowel syndrome. So it really did start off academically um, and thankfully we had um, Professor Peter Gibson who's actually the director of gastroenterology. He's a gastroenterologist himself and is the director here at um, the Alfred Hospital and our head of department for um, gastroenterology. So fortunately he was a big believer in diet, had a a role to play and um, was keen to listen to many dietitians saying, you know, we need to, you know, treat these, um, I guess, help manage irritable bowel syndrome for these patients with diet. So he said, well, let's do the research. So that's pretty much how it started. And, and that, you know, I guess that has grown into a team of people where, you know, I would probably say there's at least um, a good dozen of us that are working on the Monash FODMAP program per se, but also um, wear multiple hats. So for myself, I still do research, um, but I also wear the hat of, um, I guess, heading up the certification program, establishing key, you know, I guess, programs. Um, and, you know, you've pop- I'm not sure if you've seen it, but we can talk about it a bit later, but about the new website that we have. So, um, which have been really important for us to help deliver the outcomes of the research, but also inform patients. So, there is a big group of us. We have um, 
a reasonable size um, backing from, I guess, another group of people that um, from the university that support our group. Um, and yeah, and we're talking about heads of departments in at the Monash University um, campus site at Clayton and here, well, I'm at the Alfred Centre in Melbourne on Commercial Road. So, um, so that is, you know, we've got heads of departments that I guess, you know, help us and invest. So there's a lot of support and investment through the university as well to see this um, succeed. Um, and it has, that's why it's been so successful as well. So it um, gives you a bit of an idea that um, there's more than, um, I guess, Peter, Jane, Peter Gibson, I mentioned, Jane Muir, who is the head of translational um, research at the department and myself. Um, we travel a lot, um, but it's more than the three of us, this team. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because it's it's not just Australia; it's um it's really growing internationally. The, US, the USA has really embraced um, the low FODMAP data. I know what other countries are kind of jumping on board. Yeah, um, I would say worldwide. We actually have um, a US head of commercial activities um, who is born and bred US and is is um, located there, obviously, um, and runs a lot of our activities there. So we're growing as well um, outside of our own country, but um, it's, it's worldwide. Uh, the UK um, particularly have, um, are using this in practice. Yep. They're seeing this. Um, I mean, the, there's, um, you talked about um, how IBS is categorised and that's used, using a, a certain criteria. It's called the Rome criteria because that's happened in Rome um, where they meet. And, but there's an, another guideline called the NICE guidelines um, and in the UK, the local map diet is part of that now. So it's built in, it's starting to be built into the guidelines for clinical practice. Um, and Europe particularly is um, also got a lot of interest. Scandinavia, Canada, um, and yet, yeah, like you said, the US. Um, and we're also seeing a lot of interest um, in Asia. So from that, it, it, it tells me that in all of those countries, there's a lot of a lot of gut problems, a lot of irritable bowel syndrome. Is the, the incidence similar in most of those places? Do you know? Yes, it is. It's um, pretty much, well, it's worldwide. So right. this is not a, uh, I guess, a, you know, we, we talk about the, the developing countries versus the developed countries and Western societies versus, you know, non-Western societies. It's, it's, it's worldwide. Yeah. So uh, the research has come out worldwide, so hence the interest. So since, you know, we've been doing this for, you know, we say more than 10 years, we're now, you know, probably knocking on the door of 14 years, but um, other countries now are, are coming out with research around US, Canada, Asia is now um, showing some research how effective this is. And Scandinavia, Norway particularly, has um, uh, been a lead in this as well. Uh, Switzerland. So we've got a lot of um, research coming out globally you and showing that, the, yeah, the, IBS is worldwide. Yeah, you just mentioned that, I guess, the, um, a lot of more first world countries in the, in what you just said then. What about some of these countries that are isolated? I, I imagine a lot of the, you know, we might talk about how IBS is potentially caused or what's causing it. Um, you know, obviously our dietary changes and toxicity and a whole range of different things but maybe the undeveloped countries have less rates than IBS, I'd imagine. I don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, it's, or, no, it's, or no one's measuring them. I don't know. You know, maybe that. No, I think there's, there's a few factors we would need to consider. Not necessarily. I think, I mean, as of today, we do not know what causes IBS. We know there are triggers. So, you know, whether that's food, stress or anxiety, um, other disease states, um, can lead to IBS as a, a symptom of that disease state. So, for example, endometriosis or inflammatory bowel disease, they have, you know, gut problems So, um, or underlying IBS there, but that's not the cause of their inflammatory bowel disease or it's not the cause of the endometriosis. It's a symptom of it. So, um, so you can't exactly, we can't actually say what the cause is IBS per se. Yeah. There's, been, there's been no discoveries of you know, small pockets of people that don't seem to have IBS. There's nothing like that. <laughs> it's just no, and I think, 
Yeah, and I think the the reason the other thing we need to consider is it, there may be um, a perception that there is pockets that don't have IBS, but we also need to consider those pockets may not be um, as free to discuss their bowel habits or feel as comfortable to discuss bowel habits. I mean, we're becoming a lot better at it, um, but I think that's also because we have support groups um, such as um, you know Facebook groups and yourselves where that is a topic where people feel comfortable to be able to go to a group and discuss because there's a commonality there between groups and they're feeling comfortable to, to openly talk about it. Um, in many cultures, it's something that's not discussed. Um, saying the word fart is, you know, it's like, oh, did they say that? You know, it's like wind, gas, you know, it's something people don't talk about. It's something that, you know, you have we to- talk about know, it all the time. Yeah. And, <laughs> Yeah, and I, I'm fortunate enough that I get to talk about it at work and home because I have yeah, boys, yeah. surrounded by boys, which I love, but um, yeah. I have to race it at home and at, home and at work. So yeah. how do you explain low FODMAPs to somebody, to someone brand new, you know, it's like not another diet, I've tried everything. What's, what's, in your, what's a really simple way to explain low FODMAP diet? Is there? <laughs> well... well do you know, I guess I, I work in paediatrics. So, yeah, I guess if, if I put my clinician's hat on, I would say to a child, you know, those foods that sometimes you eat and they make you, you know, you, you do these farts and, you, you know, and, you know, and, and, you know, everyone laughs in your house. And, you know, so we might, I mean, in the UK, they love baked beans, you know, and it's like beans. And we see this song, I'm putting my, I'm, you might need to edit the musical fruit. You know, it's like beans, beans, good for your heart. The more you yeah. eat, the more you fat, right? Yeah. So, um, the better you feel, bake beans for every meal. <laughs> but yeah, but they're great for us, right? Because, you know, they're legumes, they're pulses. Um, and so I guess back to the simple part is really explaining to people those foods that you eat that just give your tummy a bit more of a rumble than others and you may have more um, wind or gas or you might fight more, fight more frequently. Now, that's all normal. That's your gut telling you it's doing what it should be doing. Mm -hmm. But it's for people that have IBS where it's exacerbated and it's, become, it's problematic for them at work, at home, at school. Um, it's painful. It can cause a lot of you know, constipation that's ongoing, which becomes very painful their gut becomes distended or bloated you know they may have diarrhea so I guess that's the IBS side of it but then to talk about FODMAPs then I just explained to them it's really an acronym that I'll, I'll, I guess um, your viewers may know what it, it stands for but it is fermentable oligosaccharides disaccharides monosaccharides and polyols and essentially what these are are short chain carbohydrates that rapidly, um, I guess, they're either poorly absorbed or they're indigestible through the gut, um, which is we don't have all the enzymes for some of these FODMAPs, and that's because we need them to get to the large bowel for fermentation by our good bacteria and just to promote really good gut health. So we want that to happen. But it's for people that have IBS that becomes problematic. Now, um, FODMAPs, the reason there's an acronym for it is because can you imagine trying to say that all the time to someone so hence it became an acronym to say um this is what we do to get you to have like your symptoms be well controlled once we reduce those in your diet now this isn't you know a big news alert where we've said you know look at this massive discovery we've got we, we've no one's known about these before and we've just worked it out this research has been going on for decades. So, you know, it's just the, the difference is that research has shown lactose to be a trigger for some people. So they've named it lactose intolerance. Then there have been studies that have looked at um, fructose. But fructose is not evil. It's, it's good. It's, it, it's found naturally in our foods. It's when it's in excess of glucose because they, you know, we, um, at the risk, I don't want to get too scientific about it, but it's, you know, they're competing for different transport mechanisms, but they're essentially in excess of glucose, so they become um, malabsorbed. But that doesn't mean anyone that goes in, um, has a test done and is, is told they have fructose malabsorption, they've got no symptoms for that 
because they've ingested more fructose and glucose. They don't have IBS. They don't have fructose malabsorption. That's the gut is doing what it's doing. Mm. So, um, can I just or, ask you, just, yeah. just just on that, I've heard from various people if you have um, some jelly beans, <laughs> you know the glucose jelly beans. Mm. Is is there any truth to that? Yeah, if you just top up with your glucose if you've consumed too much fructose, is that going to be a useful tool? No, no absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely. Um, and you'll be happy to know, um, Caroline yeah, Tuck, I know. <laughs> but there's two things. Um, Caroline Tuck, a colleague of mine, did a PhD with me, alongside me. She did a different topic, and she actually looked at that exact question. That's been studied. So, yeah, so I'm happy to share, um, If you know, after this, I'll uh, share or send me some information, I can send you the, the reference is what I'm trying to get at, um, is what she looked at was whether adding glucose helped and it Definitely didn't. Yeah. Okay. Now, from a clinician's perspective, we're actually quite happy about that mm, now, because what you're doing is essentially adding more sugar to your diet. More sugar. Yeah. So, nice um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um so it's it's probably a, a good negative study to have published and it is published out there. I'll, I'm, so I'm happy to share the, uh, the reference with you. Um, so I guess the, 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 all the different research has looked at all the different FODMAP subunits that I mentioned, the disaccharide being lactose, monosaccharides being the fructose. You've got the oligosaccharides being fructans and galacto-oligosaccharides. They come under the umbrella of oligosaccharides. And then you've got the sugar alcohol polyols, which are your sorbitol, your mannitol, artificial sweeteners come under that umbrella. They've all been studied separately. So what we did was, well, which one is it? Yeah. Like people go on a lactose-free diet or they still have problems because it wasn't lactose or they then we'll have, um, then we'll say, think that they're fructose malabsorber and then they're, they're not quite well. They're well in somewhat, but better than they were, but not quite. So by grouping them together, you, you get the most effective outcome yeah. as far as their symptoms. And then you can start investigating which ones are the actual triggers. So that is the more complicated way of explaining <laughs> what FODMAPs are. Um, hence why I like to introduce the, 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 the earliest version of no, the earliest the version is good. Yeah, I think they're <laughs> for most of us, um, at our little markets. Um, I'm interested the, um, you know, I guess, um, that sounds like a lot for a lot of people do. And they, you guys have done a lot of research on the food itself to the, and then have some tools available for people to make it really easy i guess when they're shopping mark at the shop it's like how do i if it hasn't got a low fodmap stamp on it how do i know it is or not so i guess put us through a little bit of best practice when people are considering a fodmap and where can they you know i guess find more about fodmaps yeah sure i guess i think first first and foremost it's in, in it's it's incredibly important and um, imperative that someone actually gets a, a proper diagnosis um, so anyone that's concerned and even if you are a health professional that is working such as myself as a dietitian or in the nutrition space that we are not the ones that are making that diagnosis so they may um, present as if they may have IBS but we really need to refer back to the doctor who will refer to a gastroenterologist so we really need to rule out sinister conditions such as celiac disease inflammatory bowel disease um, um, cancers and the like and the majority they are the smaller percentage of the I guess the outcome of these symptoms, but they have to be ruled out first. So people that might be scared about doing that sort of stuff, what what are some of the things that they, is it like some blood tests? What sort of you know it's like I'm thinking, oh, what are they going to do? They're going to cut me open and have a look at what's going on. Give give the the people that are sort of like I'm considering this, but I'm a bit scared of it. You know what what is the process of the testing? Yeah, well, depending on what condition is suspected, so you may go through a number of you may go through some blood tests um you may you'll need to you know depending on the condition if it's inflammatory bowel disease for example um 
well, in both cases, you'll have a colonoscopy or gastroscopy, um, or both, I should say, endoscopy. So that was basically the scope coming in. You take a, um, a bowel prep solution. If anyone has done this, they'll know what I'm talking about. And um, they may be cringing, but if you have IBS, you, you, you'll be okay with this. Um, but you have a bowel prep, which essentially means um, that it's, it's a method for clearing out the bowel. So when they actually do the scope, it's a day procedure. Um, yeah, is a, an anesthetic, a light anesthetic for them to do this. And they go in and investigate what's going on. And they can see through the bowel um, whether there's been any damage or how it's presenting, whether it's celiac disease or inflammatory bowel disease. Um, the other thing is, and there's some blood tests that you can do to help see if you're gene carrier for celiac disease. There's some preliminary tests. Um, and there, I guess before anyone even does a test, the, the gastroenterologist has a list, and as we do, of red flags, for example, we refer to them as what may be um, reasons why you want to start investigating further. Um, for example, being over um, 50, blood, um, blood in the stool, those types of um, symptoms. And again, the gut, the gut symptoms as well, that whole pain and diarrhea, altered bowel patterns, that type of thing come into play. Um, but some of the other red flags are, are real um, reasons why people need to go and get tested. And, you know, even if people are concerned and really not sure, you can re there's no reason, you know, you can't go and, and, and have a, a colonoscopy um, and that will help give you a diagnosis. Um, the, when all of those, I guess, conditions are ruled out, um, many years ago, um, gastroenterologists were, here's another patient, not sure what to do with them. There's no diagnosis. But now that people are receiving a diagnosis of IBS, they've got a name for it. Mm -hmm. And they're feeling a little bit more understood um, and it's a recognised condition. Um, and I think that's helped us be able to talk about it more um, with our patients, patients talking about it freely as well in, in, in groups and, and um, with, with their friends and family. So I've been diagnosed and I have IBS. The next step then would the, 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 the doctors refer me to a dietetic? Yeah, you that's know, the, what, I, yeah. That is the, the first uh, recommendation is that you would refer on to a dietitian. Um, and if um, a dietitian is specialised in this area or not specialised in this area, I mean, we see IBS a lot. So you don't necessarily just have to be an expert in IBS. So a dietitian will, will have that covered in her general practice or his general practice anyway. Some focus mainly on that. GI conditions, so um, don't be too concerned about which one you're, su you're supposed to uh, see. Um, now, that a dietitian will help someone reduce the number of, uh, I guess, assess the overall diet. So we need to consider, it, firstly, if the low FODMAP diet is the, the best approach. Um, it tends to, it's typically the first approach. Um, but if it was a low FODMAP diet after a complete assessment, we simply are reducing the, num the, the FODMAP content in someone's diet. So you can't actually have a, a FODMAP-free diet. No. These are naturally found in our foods. You can't eliminate them unless you just completely stopped eating fruit, vegetables, all your grains and cereals, which are great for us. So, you know, they've got fibre, they have minerals, they have vitamins. Um, and so we're reducing them to a level that our research has shown is well tolerated by people with IBS. And um, we've created the cutoffs for that through our research. And that's why we've been able to test a lot of foods and products for, for their FODMAP content. Once their symptoms are well con um, settled, um, it can take, you know, in practice, it, it takes within a week. People are finding their symptoms are, um, are improving within a week. So you might hear in, in, I guess, through the research world, people will say, you know, trial it for two to six weeks. We actually find in clinical practice, we see the results are, are rapid. 
Yeah. We say that in research. I hear that from people at market stalls. It's like, oh, yeah. so have you tried the low pop? Oh my God, yes. Like it, you yeah. know, I felt it within days. Not within every market, but really a lot of people, you can see the look of relief in their eyes yeah. when they say that. Yeah. Yes, it, it is. And that's what you see. Um, but typically we say two to six weeks because you don't see your dietitian every third day. <laughs> So um, we then, uh, I guess, give them the tools that they can use to follow a low FODMAP diet. Now, we have tested hundreds of ingredients. I, myself, my PhD was in FODMAPs um, as well. Um, I looked at um, I breastfeeding mums and infants and, and, and I guess children, but um, I can't remember them all. And we're constantly testing, and that's what uh, I guess the cost of our app is what fun enables us to do that. So I actually show impactors how to use the app, and people walk away and be are able to continue shopping, creating meals for themselves, travel. It's taken the guesswork out um, and the anxiety. To, exactly, absolutely, Jeannie. I've taken the anxiety out of it. Um, we use a simple traffic light system to indicate what's low, green, um, moderate amounts of FODMAPs are amber and high amounts of FODMAPs are, are red. But we've even drilled it down to the level of serving sizes one can have in a particular food. So if anyone has the app, if you look at um, beetroot, for example, or sweet potato, you'll see different serving sizes um, will have a different um, rating so a particular serving size. I mean, again, I, I think I've got it in my head, but I, you know, I just go straight to my app. Like I've just, it's always handy, but I guess it's more that I can't remember it all. So why would I expect my patients to remember them? So you don't need to. <laughs> so I know you don't need to. What's your advice? People saying just skipping and going straight to the app. What are the dietitians further going to support? Um, you know, a person's you know. Um, process yeah i think it's what's really important is understanding what people's diet is to begin with what do they typically eat there's no point in trying to get them to include foods in their diet they would they don't like they don't typically eat we want to we need to make tailor it to their habitual diet we've got to consider i'm a real big advocate on making sure we consider the family dynamics cultural values family values being able to be social so you need and, and and the dietitians are skilled to know how to manage all those behavioral strategies um to give someone to just go to the app um and they're looking for certain foods um and wondering if they can eat them or not um what can they modify instead i think is is a skill in itself but what people tend to do is just remove foods rather than replace them yeah. So it's really important that going and seeing a dietitian will ensure that you have complete nutrition intake in its optimal because if they do it on their own, they may be at risk and there's studies already coming out, already out. Risk of calcium is low because they'll remove all the dairy, not replace. Yeah. Their risk of fibre is low. So they start removing certain fruits and grains but they're not replacing their fibre. So their fibre intake ends up low. We can help with that, perhaps. <laughs> yes, you could. You actually could. I completely <laughs> agree. Um, and so that's why diet, you know, it, it doesn't matter what condition we're talking about. When we're talking about dietary therapy for a condition, whether it's, um, um, I, I use the analogy of food allergens, to, you know, you need to be able to explore how you're going to have that person's diet be nutritionally complete. Yeah. Look, it leads me to the next part. And when we do have a lot of health practitioners, whether they're, you know, store buyers, um, naturopaths in store, dietitians who want to help their patients, because as I guess the industry is always, the food industry is giving people some sort of re relief or some things that are being tested that may relieve sort of bloating and all that sort of stuff. But people want to know a little bit more um, about it. And you guys have got a training program for people that, I guess, exactly what you're sort of saying, help their clients go through the process of using the app and, you know, sort of discovering what might fit and, you know, within their lifestyle. So um, tell us a little bit about that training program and then, um, you know, what sort of things they learn and over what sort of time frame? 
Yeah, sure. Um, so for exactly, um, I guess, based on the previous question is how does a dietitian help or help a professional? We've set up an online course so that um, people can do the course anywhere around the globe at any time. Um, because we used to run workshops over a, a couple of days and dietitians around the um, country would come and visit, but then the demand is growing globally. So the online course helps meet those needs globally uh, for health professionals um, and particularly dietitians that want to get into, the, into this space or are already in this space. Um, so it teaches them, it's a, the, the online course runs for, you have six months to complete it. There's 10 modules. There. It's very comprehensive and um, I, I guess it, it, the languages that are quite, you know, it's at a medical, I guess, level, but um, it teaches them how to introduce a low format diet in practice um, and what tools are available to themselves and the patients. Then how to, um, once their symptoms are well, tolerated or well controlled um, how to reintroduce foods because the reason we do low FODMAP and we're using all the subunits is just so we can get some relief for these patients but they're not all going to be a problem for people so we start to investigate what type of FODMAPs or food ingredients are the triggers so they may eventually only have a handful of ingredients that are you know are problematic or creating these uh, causing these symptoms for them so we start to reintroduce them and that's done in a systematic way. So the course will teach how to do that systematically, no different to how we introduce solids to infants, really, um, one at a time, wait for two or three days, see if there's a response, how they tolerate it. And you, yeah, I guess the same with allergens, um, food allergens, sorry. So, um, so we do, we work with them through that. And then what tends to happen is, um, everyone whose IBS will be different to the next person. So symptom severities vary um, and what people put up with vary. Um, so what we reintroduce will vary and um, everyone ends up with their own personalized diet essentially at the end. So the course will teach people how to, how to do that from start to finish, how to consider adjunct therapies and when to refer. So in, and such it might be hypnotherapy, there's research um, which we, we uh, started and is now coming out in other areas where hypnotherapy has been of benefit to a uh, certain population group with, um, say, stress or anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, we have look at how to treat it in endometriosis. There's a little bit of research in that. Um, more needs to come for that, though. Um, and um, some of my research is built into the course as well about how to... Um, um, look at it in breastfeeding mothers that and infants that have colic. So there's that, different. That, can I stop you there and ask you about that? Yeah. So is there some like this is your research? Um, yeah. What are the impacts of FODMAPs on breastfeeding mums and their babies with colic? Is there some 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 evidence that that can play a big role? Yeah, um, great question. One paper is already published. Uh, and that is our proof of concept study, just to see if infants' um, symptoms actually, in fact, did change, do change. That's published, and I can tell you that study showed um, a rapid um, change in their infants. So and we're talking about exclusively breastfeeding mums, so are changing their yeah. diet. That's what we're referring to. And infants that meet, um, I guess, there is a criteria for colic as well, um, where infants are um, excessively crying and really difficult to um, settle. The randomised control trials are almost there for public, well, it's already in the hands of the reviewers um, and being um, tweaked a little bit, but just um, as a publication goes. So that's about to be published, but... Um, I'm not sure how much I can say, but happy to maybe talk about it when it is published. But um, there is evidence there that, I mean, that it's it, it, it works. Again, this has been going on for years. It goes back to that question you asked me, how do you in simple terms explain it? In that paper, I, I explain exactly how I explain it in practice. Mums avoid those windy foods when they have breastfeeding. So you've got yeah, your cabbage, your garlic, yeah. your onion, yeah. and what are they high in? FODMAPs. Yeah, that's so, it. Yeah. yeah, so my research is continuing because we're now trying to investigate what the mechanism is. Ooh.
what is changed. And is there a FODMAP that is the biggest culprit by far? Like, I mean, is there one that stands out as most people don't tolerate it or are they just all different? Like different people can tolerate different FODMAPs. Is there one that's like, you know, the ringleader? Like, is it, who's the winner? Polyols or fructans or? <laughs> yeah, uh, good question. I think it, it is so variable, but I think if you, and, and again, I'm, I'm talking based on clinical practice, garlic and onions seem to just, Lead the race, garlic, you know. What I hear at markets is garlic, onion, and bread, those three. So I'm yeah, and bread is the fructans. Yeah, absolutely. And it's the fructans. And fructans seem to affect a certain group of people, um, but then, you know, un- and onion, but then garlic isn't so bad. And then there's others that are, the garlic's not great, but the onion isn't so bad, depending on how it's cooked and if it's raw it's painful and if it's mm. and if it's cooked and simmered sauteed really nicely or quite Paralyzed. <laughs> it's manageable you know those sorts of things so and is, um, it, is it just because those three foods are just so everywhere in our diets you know is it is that the reason too you know yeah well there's a lot of them in them in those ingredients so um the dose is high in them as well so and and legumes is if you think of um vegetarian veganism um cultures that uh in asia that practice uh for different uh reasons um you know veganism or vegetarianism um and eat a lot of legumes yeah um they have a, you know, a problem with them Mm. So in, in, I guess in our country, we're not big consumers of legumes. So we don't come up with that. But in other countries, That's legumes true. problem. Mm. Yeah. So in one of my studies, um, we found that in a, a place in Africa, when they have babies, they cut out the onion and the legumes. Wow. So I'm going to go back to this sort of patient process. I, I've now been to a dietitian. I've been on low fob maps now. For a couple of months, um, a lot of my symptoms that I had are just about gone and I am now craving for some onion and hot dogs. <laughs> Give me some on, baked beans on toast. <laughs> on, on, and is, is that, so reintroducing that, are you finding that people, something's happened to the gut and it can handle it a lot more um, and or forever? Or, or is it something that I've just got to be cautious that these FODMAP foods if I overeat them, I'm ten. I'm going to tend towards to go to my my symptoms again and bloating, and I've just got to stick to a quarter of a piece of toast with beans. Maybe yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's the latter. So you do. It's going back to personalising. No one ever goes back to how they were eating before. Um, uh, I guess their diagnosis or, or having symptom relief. Yeah. You don't. You don't have these. You, you know, your symptoms are alleviated, and then all of a sudden, you, you I can go back to eating how I used to. It's yeah. that's what was your trigger. Yeah. Um, so people will eat as um, you both have just said. Will have a, a smaller amount. They may like to go out for dinner and maybe have more when they're on a Friday night, knowing they're home on a Saturday. They can manage their symptoms. They they cope with it because you just. Because it's, um, it's expected. Less not anxious. It's just like, yeah, yeah. I was coming yeah. Home to myself. I'm okay with that because I had fun. <laughs> yeah, and and I can manage it. I'm okay. There's nothing wrong. I, you know, there's nothing more sinister than that. Um, I can control it rather than it controlling me. I think absolutely. So you become your control, and when you're when you're happy to put up with a few more symptoms than others. And you know, in practice, we knew. I mean, and farting's fine. You're supposed to you got to let your gas out. So, you know, it's just you're normal. Not you're not fermenting, right? That's yeah, just, exactly. Just ask everyone to be quiet for a second. Oh, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it, what, that wasn't me. <laughs> but um, but you know, you and you get the bloating, and that's normal again. It's your gut doing what it's supposed to. So. Really highlighting to people when they come back to practice and say, oh, I, you know, I farted three times yesterday. I think my symptoms are coming back. It's, that's probably a good thing. You know, just it's smile and know that you're times. doing well. That's fine. If you're doing it 50 times a day, that's really let's really look average. at it. <laughs> you know Sometimes it's, you know, some people's farts are so, you know, the odor, you know, let's talk about the odor. It's, it's a real problem and they can't be anywhere. Um, 
they cannot it is a real different it's really awful situation where they're it's very embarrassing for them they have to keep leaving the meeting rooms or they don't end up turning up to work yeah yeah i think ibs is one of the highest rates now of having a sick day in australia yes the second highest Second, second only highest. to the respiratory infections or the common cold. Yeah, as well. yeah. So, so a little bit of government cost. support maybe might get um, you know people the productivity back to work. of the nation. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you know, this is you have to live with this for um, most of your life. But if you can live, and people are we're finding a and not being diagnosed for decades later because you know although we've been doing this research for 13 years, it's it's still you know it's still the awareness is still growing. Um, and, and it's evolving. You know about it. It's evolving. But in mainstream, I mean, if we talk about mainstream, FODMAP, the word, is still not in the mainstream, I would say, as right. a word. It's creeping in. It's creeping yeah. in. It is. I used to get blank stares, and now I'm kind of getting a few more nods of understanding. But yeah, definitely, yeah. In the last, probably last three years, it's definitely. It's changed, mm. and I and, and we're grateful for I guess people like yourselves like um, have seen the value in this, and then you know you make a claim that it's low FODMAP, and you can do that when you have an endorsing body that that can put their stamp on it, um, and we're actually seeing that's growing as well. So um, you know, lots more um, food industry companies are, are having our um, they're in the app when they're certified with us, food industry, but now they're, they want, you know, they need to be showing it on packet. So you'll see that a bit more um, like yourselves, but, um, and that I think brings awareness to the term and what it's for. Yeah. So yeah. I think eventually it will be mainstream um, and, you know, not dissimilar, I guess, to the gluten-free diet, yeah. but let's hope so, um, this is not a diet for everyone. Yeah. I think it's, you know, celiac disease needs to have a gluten-free diet, but then we had the gluten-free diet craze as being a healthy diet, which is actually not the case. So yeah. we need to make sure this one's tailored appropriately and um, it's not banded as a, a, the health, next healthy fad diet, if you like. Well, there can be really unhealthy foods that are low FODMAP too, right? I mean, like, oh. there's lots of junk food that's low fun math so you know <laughs> exactly right and there's um no different to gluten-free products they exactly. how do they make them palatable and lots of fat sugar yeah. sodium yeah and i think that's it sort of leads me to my next question with the importance of the training program um you know and understanding people's diets and their diet requirements um, they might get on top of some other things that the people have going on through a little bit of investigation and that you know um leading to the next question for all those sort of health practitioners out there, where do they find more about how to accept the online courses? Or can they just go and log in and start? Is yep. it a month program? And, you know, are you guys going to keep supporting this as new research goes out and doing updates and stuff? Yeah, um, absolutely. So our new website, which was launched in October, late October last year, it's um, simply monashfodmap.com. So it won't be hard to find. Um, online courses on there that you can register an account and start at any time. Um, there obviously is a fee associated with it, but you have six months to complete it. There's an exam at the end of it um, for registered dietitians in the US and accredited practicing dietitians in um, Britain, Australia, get a certificate and the, they all the points. So you in Australia, we have continued professional development um, hours. And in the US, they use a point system. Um, in the US, it's 25 points that all goes towards um, your credit, uh, continued accreditation as a, as a dietitian. Mm -hmm. um, outside of that, health professionals can still complete it if they're, if they're not a dietitian. Um, we still have, we actually, you know, gastroenterologists and GPs that are hearing more about this from their own patients are wanting to learn about it. So, um, which is great. Um, and some do not have access to a dietitian or yet, um, or referring on just yet. So it's a course that they can do as well. Um, so it's online, um, access it from monashformap.com, you register and away you go. Um, it's the same for our food industry. If they are looking at products to certify, the online platform now um, manages all of that. Set up an account, the entire billing uh, uh, process and um, 
the steps for the program are outlined on the website, but um, it's all managed by the, the platform behind the scene. And um, we still, we do all the testing in our lab and um, the app, you get information about the app on the website. There's a booklet you can get on the website. Um, so all our products and services, anything you need to know about um, us and the diet, you can find on our website. Anything you'd like to purchase is on there. So I guess we've created this, uh, the old saying goes, a one-stop shop for everyone. So course will be updated as we more research comes out as well. Yeah, wonderful. With, um, so with all this um, awareness that's growing with, you know, health practitioners being trained and the general public becoming more aware, um, I'm thinking we'll probably, start to see things like low FODMAP sections in supermarkets and health stores and just in mainstream low FODMAP options on all the cafe menus, um, the low FODMAP expo festival, all this sort of thing. I mean, is that reality? In, yeah, to where, me, it where, seems like it, where's the, it's a give us some Give us some scoop on what's happening in the future. What's <laughs> exciting? You know, what are you guys, what are you guys doing? Yeah, well, it's all of that. It's um, the, I guess, um, why I said, you know, it's, IBS in the uh, for the future is going to be mainstream. Um, there will be expos. We're already at the expos um, every year. We it's another reason we travel to the US because um, we get invited not just to talk about it. We then uh, we're now exhibitors as well, becoming um, very experienced at being exhibitors um, and spreading the word and and um, you each year and we've been doing it for two years I think the one year we were the only ones there I think last year we were at a um, food nutrition conference um, in the US and I think we had about oh, 10 different um, mainly food industry uh, promoting products as being certified to be low FODMAP uh, which was great. So we're seeing a lot of our partners that collaborate with us in the food industry for products. Um, we Which just is great got for back. people too because that sort of just takes the guesswork out of it, doesn't it? You know, absolutely. So a trusted, uh, you know, certification at a glance it. without having to yeah. go to the app or anything. Yeah. That's the idea. And so, you know, we partnered with one of the food industries um, in April in the US, who is actually in the US um, and Canada, and moving into Japan market. Um, and working together so we can explain the science um, and they are great at, you know, promoting the product, I guess. But um, I think it's, it's uh, going to be in the supermarket a lot more. Well, you're, even, you're seeing it now in social media where there's certain affiliate people and that people are, you know, they're FODMAP recipe specialists and, uh, you know, dietitians just, you know, their whole thing, their niche now is their FODMAP and their value, you know, that that's their sort of, you know, I guess their angle. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's exploding. You see a lot of that as well. So. Yeah. What, about, what about for um, FODMAP awareness for the general person who doesn't suffer from IBS? Like, for example, I know myself, if I am, I've, I've figured out through <laughs> maybe it's a FODMAP thing. If I have too many apples in one sitting, I'm likely to be a bit bloaty and farty later on. I'm thinking, is that the FODMAP? So maybe I'm a little sensitive to too many polyols, is it? I'm not sure. Yeah, it's, it's the polyols general and the excess fructose in the apple. So there's okay. a, two, you've got a double whammy going on there. Okay, so for the general public to just have that general awareness of maybe if I don't have IBS, but if I do overdo some FODMAPs, I may tend to suffer a little bit or be a little bit you know, bloated, uncomfortable, farty, whatever, you know, that sort of stuff. Is it something that the general public is useful to, to have that awareness of as well? Oh, absolutely. I think um, especially when it, to, to bring back the normality of it, I think it's going back to saying uh, bring back the normality of it's okay to fart and it's okay to have a bit of a, a bloated tummy um, and your gut is is doing what it should be doing. Yeah. Um yeah, I think that will come. Um, I think um, there's, a, I guess, a fine line between making sure that we're not saying apples aren't good for us because they're yeah, certainly and, great for us. And it's, um, not a diet, it's not a diet that we're recommending for people to go on at all unless no. you manage IBS. That's the reason for it. Yeah, and I would rather someone have two apples a day um, than half an apple a day who does not have IBS because they're getting their fruit intake in. So, you know, I always bring it back in my, I guess in, in my world of pediatrics, um, we see a lot of this in 
children that may not have IBS at all, but they're having all sorts of problems with their bowel. Um, but the thing with children, I mean, it's another topic again, but, you know, we tend to give them foods they'll readily accept. So they'll, <laughs> as parents, we don't want those arguments at dinner so it's like have as much pasta as you like have as much fruit juice you know not that I recommend fruit juice but that does happen that's reality you know they've had fruit all day because that didn't want anything else so you know children as young as two may only need you know three one piece of fruit a day but they've had five they've had two liters of milk instead of a cup my tummy wouldn't be doing so great with two liters of milk either so, you know, we need to put it into perspective. Yeah. Can we get you back at, as a um, take your FODMAP hat off and put the um, the paediatric hat on? That would be an awesome interview too. I love it. <laughs> can tell. Yeah. Well, that's sort of, you know, we, we, we don't want to go too over time. People will be um, um, going, come on, Brad and Jeannie, get off. We've yep. got to get back to work. Yep. But um, it, you've been wonderful. I, I really appreciate your time. This has been really informative. Mm-hmm. We'll put some links in. Um, people might have some burning questions, whether you're on the, the webinar now or live. Um, look, we'll monitor those comments. But to be honest, most of the time people are watching this tonight. You know, so we will continue to monitor it down the track. Really, really appreciate your time and um, thank yeah, you. Look forward thank to uh, you. getting you on again. Yeah, I'd love to. Thanks for having me. It's um, it's thank a joy you. to be able to share this information with you and your followers that might be watching. So yeah, thank you. That's all right. Well, we're just uh, going to wrap up the show. Um, yeah. Wow, that was. Uh, that's great. What's some of the what's what's some of the big takeouts you took out of that? Oh, I was fascinated by the um the research that's happening with the colic. That's you know massive. You know mm-hmm. that's really a game changer for so many mums that are you know if, if it turns out that this is a an amazing tool that they can use. That's that's that was my big yeah. Aha. Well, I yeah. guess um you know big thing for me that I took out is that you can't just go and get the app and really think that you're yeah. going to just go and do this on your oh, own, look, you know. When you, Getting, look, when you look at the app, it's kind of like, oh, I need help with that, or maybe that's just me. But Well, I think it's a great tool, but to, you really need that kickstart. And look yeah, at that a history. Bit of a coach. Because, you know, and even going to the, the gastro doctors first, because you might just assume you have some sort of IBS, but they don't, might find something really serious. You get tested. You don't if mess with your gut, do you? gut symptoms, you get it tested. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ah, good well thank you everybody for joining us um what have we got coming up we have got um and we're trying to get a a special guest on to give us the perspective of the patients the ibs patients uh, how, to, best practice. how to be a good patient how to be a good patient in order to get the best outcomes for yourself so we've got someone to help us yeah coach coach you ibs people to being a good patient to get your best outcome and look to, you know, if you guys want to keep putting us to, you know, or want us to put these shows together, you know, definitely recommend, you know, a topic or something that you think, and you know, we'll scout out there. Who should for, we chat to? Who should mm. we chat to? And, and who's up for a chat? Yeah. And then, of course, anytime you've got any special questions, contact uh, us through the website or Jeannie's email, and she can definitely can refer you on to Marina or get a little bit more feedback, studies done, um, or refer you to some of the dietitians. I imagine it's probably something we didn't look at, but I imagine there's probably a list somewhere where there is, you know, uh, a list of accredited. dietitians. Well, not accredited, but people that have gone through the, the training yeah. program mm-hmm. and, and um, yeah, and they can know their way around the format. Yeah, maybe, we need, maybe there's a little map somewhere. I might go maybe check we it can out on the website. It, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, thanks very much, guys, uh, for watching again. And we'll see you next time. Of course, we always love you to eat, play, and poo. Yeah. Or, or fart. We talked a lot about farting uh, eat, today's interview. Eat, it was good. Eat what you love and, yeah, be, feel free to um, to play and not let the poo problems be in the way. <laughs> That's it. All right, guys, we'll see you for now. Thank you very much for joining us. And um, we'll see, see you next time. Bye. Cheers. Bye.